With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten, tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? God has told you, O mortal one, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Let us worship. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we gather where we are. We listen for your word. We seek your face. We long to have the wisdom to know your will and the courage to do it. Be with us in our gathering, wherever, whenever that gathering takes place. Here in our separation and one day, in our togetherness. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Miss Stacy. I help out teaching the fifth grade and up here at Mount Sinai. My students, I miss them so much. Ella, Lily, Gracie, and Columbia. You know, oh, sorry, what about these? Um, you know, being stuck at home, working from home, I have to sometimes entertain myself. So, I like to play dress up. Do you like to play dress up? Hmm, let me just show you a couple of things that I wear. Be right back. That's elementary, my dear Watson. If you have no self worth, then putting it on the wrist. Go. Well, here I am, back to simple old me. It's fun dressing up. All the costumes, all the fun stuff. And I know no matter what I wear or look like, on the outside, God loves me. And what I think God wants more is to dress up our hearts, to make sure that we display love and kindness and generosity and patience. So dressing up on the outside is fun, but let's remember to show up and dress up with each other. Now, I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to give you half a heart because nobody in my family wants to be around me right now to give the other half. So, love you, miss you, can't wait to see you all soon. Adios. Scripture is from Acts 17, Paul in Athens. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it he who is Lord of heaven and earth, 
does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, We will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them, but some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysus, the Arapagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Let us pray. Gracious God, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Let your word dwell within us. Let us not simply be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you this morning. Grace and peace. What does it mean to be the church in the time of COVID? Last summer, we had banners hung up outside the church, and they said, be the church, protect the environment, care for the poor, forgive often, reject racism, fight for the powerless, Share earthly and spiritual resources, embrace diversity, love God, enjoy this life. And all of those things are still good ways of being the church, even in the age of this pandemic. But someone recently changed it a little bit, updated it, and the new one works really well too. It says, be the church. Stay home, social distance, wash your hands, check on the elderly, live stream worship, give electronically, support each other, love God, flatten the curve, pray daily so we can all enjoy this life. Not a bad update. Paul was trying to be the church in the first century. And he did it in ways that got him in trouble. Wherever he went, he preached the resurrection of Jesus. And sometimes it would get him in trouble with religious folks who wanted things the way they had always been. And sometimes it got him in trouble with the, the Gentile folks, the folks not in the covenant religion, but who were into philosophy and all that sort of thing. And they had no time for such a God of covenant. Sometimes it was so bad he would get thrown in jail or run out of town. The reading we have today, he's in Athens. He's been kicked out of Thessalonica, and the ones who didn't like him there followed him to Berea, and they kicked him out of there too. And so his friends get him all the way to Athens, and now he's in this bustling, multicultural city that was the crown of the Greek world. 
and still a gem in the empire of Rome. And here he is surrounded by idols, shrines to this god and that god and every kind of god imaginable and some that are unimaginable. The Greeks had gods for everything. The god of the harvest and the god of the rains, the god of love and the god of war. The sun was a ball of fire pulled by Apollo's chariot through the sky and lightning was the spear of Zeus. When Romans came along, they had many of the same gods, so they simply renamed the Greek gods. So then Zeus became Jupiter, and Poseidon, the god of the sea, became Neptune. And then they added even more. They started making some of their emperors into gods. And in addition, every city back then would have a, a patron god of the city. And then there were household gods that families prayed to for the safety of the children, for, for pregnancy, for, for making sure they had income, for whatever it was they were praying for. One of the charges against Christians and Jews in ancient times is they were atheists. It didn't mean they didn't have a god. And some of you remember History of the World Part 1, where Comicus jokes that how poor are these people? They're so poor they can only afford one god. What they didn't mean was they didn't have a god. It was The problem was Christians and Jews would not go and bow down to and worship and sacrifice to the city gods and the national gods and all the other gods. And it was believed that if you angered one of these gods, you were courting danger in whatever realm that god covered. And so when Christians and Jews did not bow down or make sacrifices to the city gods and the national gods, they were called atheists and they were blamed for whatever trouble came to the city. Looking around today, do we have shrines and idols around us? Maybe not in the same way Paul saw there in Athens. But if we look at billboards, what do we see? The idols of the billboards say that if we just sacrifice our money, our lives, our time on their altar, then we can have the safety, the look, the car, the love, the money, the whatever it is that we deserve. These are idols, shrines to play on our fears. American politics has its own idols, and most of those idols are sitting in shrines marked NIMBY. NIMBY means not in my backyard. The shrine of NIMBY accepts the sacrifice of putting others' lives at risk for the sake of one's own convenience. NIMBY accepts the sacrifice of reasonable loss of lives as long as it's someone else's lives and it does not impinge on our own desires. We do have idols. We do have shrines. In the midst of all that Paul saw in Athens, there was a shrine not labeled Athena Nike, the goddess of wisdom who is victorious, or Apollo, or Mars. This one's marked to an unknown god. Some have suggested this was an ancient insurance policy. We sacrifice to all the different gods, so we have all our bases covered. But what if there's one we don't know about? Tell you what, we're going to set up a, an altar, a, a shrine, to an unknown god. That way, in case there's one we don't know about, they can have their portion, won't get mad at us, and we will be safe. We don't want trouble sneaking up on us, do we? Well, Paul stands there and he says, let me tell you about the God you don't know. Let me tell you about the maker of heaven and earth, the creator of the universe. Let me tell you about a God not made by human hands out of gold or silver or marble or exotic woods like those enshrined around you. Paul speaks to them of the God of the covenant, the God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob, and Rachel and Leah, the God of Moses and the Exodus, the God of the prophets, the God of Jesus of Nazareth. 
And this is also our message in our world filled with all of our idols. The message is not church. It is not Christianity. It is not the United Church of Christ. The message is not even Mount Sinai Congregational Church. Our message in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of the idols, our message is the love of Jesus Christ, which shows us the love of God. And this is our message because behind every idol, back then and today, Behind every idol is fear. In Athens, when they feared not getting rain, rain for the crops, they put up an idol to that god and prayed and sacrificed and worshipped. Today, when we fear not being loved, we sacrifice to the idol of doing what it takes to be accepted or maybe even popular, rather than becoming who we really are ourselves. The billboards advertise everything. Stuff that will make us liked or loved or sexy or rich or young again or happy or safe or whatever it is we fear we don't have enough of. Our idols play on our insecurities and our fears. Our politics play on our fears. Fear of the current administration, fear of the previous administration, fear of governmental overreach, fear of lack of governmental support, fear of the government knowing too much about our private lives, fear of the government not knowing enough about the current pandemic. And it's possible to have multiple fears in this all at the same time. And just like all our other fears, people will sacrifice to all sorts of idols to try and feel safe again. Here's how we can be the church in the midst of COVID-19. We can look past the idols and we can recognize how much fear there is in our world. And we can recognize, and this is hard, Nobody said this was going to be easy. We can recognize the fear in ourselves. And when we're honest about our fears, we can be honest about the love of God. A love that loves us even in the midst of our fears, even in spite of our fears, regardless of our fears. A love that says, you are loved so much, let me help you with your fears. Not that we have to sacrifice ourselves on the altar of any idol to placate our fears, but that God's love is big enough that when we accept it, there's no room for fear. Here's how we can be the church in the midst of COVID-19. We can love one another. Love one another in ways that can help us hear past the fears. Help us hear our way into a new way of understanding one another. And if we can, if we can listen to one another in love, By God's grace, we can find common ground. Find common ground that seeks not to sacrifice us or our neighbor on the altar of any idol, but finds a way to deal with the causes and sources of our fears so that it might mean resurrection. It might mean new life. It might mean knowing the love of God in ourselves and in our neighbors. Now, just like in Paul's day, some people will be swayed by this and other people will say, they're babbling. They're talking foolishness. And just like in Paul's day, that's okay. It's okay that this message seems foolish to some. 
Because to those of us who are being saved, this is the grace of God. To love one another, even as Jesus loves us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, for our time of prayer today, I will offer prayer petitions, and following each one, I will say, O Lord, hear our prayer. And I invite you to respond where you are by saying, And in your mercy, answer. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we are praying for a world in distress, a world that is hemmed in by concerns about a global pandemic and by concerns for the life and the lives of our loved ones and our world of neighbors. We pray for those whose work has been interrupted and whose income is not secure. We ask your abundance and your sufficiency. O oh Lord, hear our prayer and in your mercy answer. For those whose work has been interrupted, whose income is not secure, prayer. Friends, I'm going to offer some prayer petitions, and following each petition, I will say, O oh Lord, hear our prayer, and I invite you to respond, and in your mercy answer. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we are praying for a world in distress, a world that is hemmed in by concerns about a global pandemic, by concerns for the life and the lives of our loved ones and our world of neighbors. We pray for those whose work has been interrupted and whose income is not secure. We ask for your abundance and for your sufficiency. Lord, hear our prayer. For those whose work is deemed essential, and so they are at greater risk of infection, we ask your protection and your shelter. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For those who face difficulties before the world shut down and are now struggling even harder in mind or body or spirit, we ask your healing grace, O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For those whose homes are unsafe, whether by construction or by abuse or by intolerance, we ask your shelter of those who are afraid and your defense of those who are oppressed. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For those without homes, which in normal times is difficulty enough, but in these times is so much worse, we ask your guidance to communities to help to find ways to shelter those in need. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For those who lead communities, towns, cities, states, and nations, we ask your spirit of wisdom and discernment, as well as the gift of speaking the truth. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For those moving from place to place or job to job, from what is known to what is unknown, we ask your presence and your guidance. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are sick during this time, whether with COVID-19 or another illness or disease, we ask your healing and your hope. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For those in grief, whether the loss of a loved one or the loss of the familiar, or the myriad losses of this day, 
We ask the comfort and support of your Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Mighty God, in whom we know the power of redemption, you stand among us in the shadows of our time. As we move through every sorrow and trial of this life, uphold us with the knowledge of the final morning when, in the glorious presence of the risen Christ, we will share in his resurrection, redeemed and restored to the fullness of life and forever free to be your people. We lift up these prayers, as well as those prayers that weigh on our hearts and minds, those prayers that we pray now in these moments, moments of silence. All this we pray in Jesus' name as we join our voices together in the prayer that he taught, using the words on the screen or those closest to your hearts, the prayer that begins, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we gather at the table. As we have done so every week. It is not our usual way to gather for communion every week. Well, the, the 8.30 service has done it. But the 10 o'clock service is the first Sunday of the month. But while we are apart, while we long to be together, we have gathered at this table every time we have come together for worship. For we remember our communion with God with the church, and with one another. And so we gather with bread and cup, whatever form those take for you, wherever you are. The night of his betrayal, the Lord took bread. He broke it as he blessed it, and then he said, My body given for you is what this means. Remember now, my children, what you have seen. And then he took the chalice and raised it high. My blood is given for you, a full supply a covenant, a promise, a cleansing stream. Remember now, my children, what you have seen. We share this meal together, remembering Christ. We share a common treasure and know the price. We share it without measure, a gift of love. We share our lives together with God above. The body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. cup of the new covenant poured out for you. Take and drink.
Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you have gathered us again, along with that cloud of witnesses, the communion of saints, gathered from across this world, gathered in separate homes at separate tables, and yet each of them in this time is your table, is your home. Bless us to go forth from this time of worship, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, to seek to live lives of justice and peace, to love one another in our world of neighbors, even as you love us. This all we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, in this time of our opportunities to serve, several things are happening in our church. Not necessarily in our building, but in our church. Soon we're going to have a call list so we can check up on people. If you have a desire to make calls, or if you have a desire to be called, let us know. You can contact me, you can contact the church office, you can contact Barbara DeTurk or Dennis Murphy. We're all coordinating and, and putting this together. It may not get up and running right away, but give us a, a little bit of time. The second thing is masks. We're still making masks, and we still know that some people need masks. If you are in need or want to make them, please contact our church office. Graduations are coming up, and we're not graduating the way we used to. It's going to be different, but then again, everything is different these days. What we want is if, if people are getting signs for their yards, for seniors, whether high school or college or even beyond, we would like to get signs here at the church. So let us know if you have a graduating senior. You can contact me, you can contact the church office, you can contact Donna McInerney. We want to have these for Baccalaureate Sunday, which will be in June, and we'll have them out in front of the church. We will also put those images into our worship video as well as we honor people that day. Also, I've got good news and good news. We're not going to call it good news, bad news. The good news is we have Zoom, and that means we are hosting meetings. We're going to start up Bible study here coming up. We've already had some meditation sessions going on and wonderful feedback from these. We're also doing Zoom coffee hours. So there will be a link in the email that came to you regarding this service and the recording and everything. A link for Zoom coffee hour where we get together and we see each other and talk. This can also be called in. You can, you can call with your phone into the Zoom meeting. So maybe you don't have a computer with a camera. Maybe your hair isn't coiffed the way you want for a Sunday morning. However that is, you can join us. We need hosts. That's the also good news. It's not bad news. It's good news. We need some Zoom hosts. For example, uh, Charlene Absel has been helping us with some of our early meetings, but with her other work and everything else, she can't do all of these. So um, Mary Hobson has agreed to help out with hosting some of the Zoom coffee hours. Hosting doesn't take a lot of work. There's just a few little bits of training that need to happen so you know what you're doing. And it's fairly easy. So if you wanna help host stuff at the church via Zoom, you can contact me, you can contact uh, Charlene Apsel or the church office. I'm sure there are other announcements as well, and we are trying to get those out to you via email and other ways. We are working on improving our communications. Please let us know other ways we might improve them.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May God's countenance be lifted up upon you. May you always know God's peace. Amen and amen.